Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Kexin, and this is Jakov, as we just mentioned. We're here today to share uh, our experience in scaling up large-scale data science applications and how Spark is helping us through the case. Uh, so you are all familiar, I'm sure, with uh, Salesforce, the uh, customer relationship management enterprise software company that shuts down San Francisco once a, once a year for Dreamforce. Um, but here's some facts that you might be less familiar with. I certainly was before we joined. Um, Salesforce is the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing software uh, enterprise companies in the world. We'll cross 10 billion projected in revenue this year. And it doesn't look like we're going to stop anytime soon. And this is mainly due to the fact that Salesforce is much, much more than B2B CRM systems these days. Uh, with uh, huge advances into B2C and the AI spaces with platforms like the commerce platform, e-commerce platform. We're one of the biggest e-commerce platform in the world. Uh, service, we're the leading service platform in the world. IoT, and of course, marketing cloud. And with the introduction of Einstein, uh, artificial intelligent platform deeply embedded into all the products, with, uh, the smartest customer success platform in the world. So Keshin and I work on a Salesforce DMP, formerly known as Crux. We joined, uh, got acquired at the end of last year. And a DMP stands for a data management platform. For our clients, we collect, store, analyze, and activate what we call people data. And what we mean by that is think about all the users that visited uh, a company or a brand site, like say Red News on the New York Times or users that have interacted uh, with, a, with a brand through social media, like interacting with Coca-Cola on Facebook, or bought products from a company like L'Oreal on Walmart or Amazon. Uh, and those that saw uh, marketing or ad impressions, for example, online, like for a company like Kellogg's. We really have some of the top publishers and marketers uh, in the world. And due to that fact, we see large proportions of the internet. So how large? Let's put some numbers into it. So, People, some of you are familiar with this notion of a, a minute, an average minute in the life of the internet. Um, so in an average minute, you might see 500,000 tweets, 900,000 Facebook logins, maybe you know, 3.5 million Google search queries. Well, we operate in a scale uh, that might be even slightly bigger than that. We see 5 million data capture events every minute and more than 4 million user match uh, pixels fired every single minute. On an average month, we process, we see more than 4 billion unique users. Uh, and we process on behalf of our clients tens of petabytes of data. Uh, just to put it in perspective, you know, this is more than 60 libraries of Congress uh, worth of data. So really large, large scale. So let's look at the system we use to uh, process all that data. Yeah, sure. Um, so in order to process data at this scale, we build a comprehensive JavaScript tagging library to deploy on clients' website uh, to collect data on, the, on that site. We also have iOS and Android SDKs to deploy on clients' mobile phone apps. In order to process all these data capture events, we have large-scale system built in order to do that. On the other hand, we also have server-to-server -server integration that handles online and offline data ingestions. So all these data flows into different parts of the data processing system through distributed queues like Kafka. And we use, utilize a lot of the AWS data pipeline to orchestrating on the tasks. We also build an open source library to help called Hyperion to help developers scheduling, um, doing task dependencies, fault tolerance, and resource management. Um, at any single given moment, we run more than 3,000 EC2 instances and with hundreds of EMR clusters. These, these tasks on these clusters ranging from very simple data cleaning, normalization, aggregation tasks to the more complex data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence products. And one of those products is called Looklike. So we're here to talk about, again, about how to scale data science. And so we thought we'd pick an example of one of the products that we've built and, and sh share with you how, you know, how we scaled it up. So before we go into the, uh, the implementation details, just a little bit of background to motivate lookalikes 
think uh, about a marketer use case. You know, marketers want to find users that look like their best customers, right? This is a common use case. Uh, how we do that, we can build a, a model that characterizes the, cast, the loyal customers based on their own features, and then take that model and ask every other user in the system the following question. What is the, you know, how similar you are to those uh, original loyal customers given your own particular set of features, right? The resulting users we call lookalikes. Let's look uh, at a quick demo of how a customer might use it. So I'm logged into the Salesforce DMP here, um, the Northern uh, Trail Outfitter uh, brand, which is, uh, for the sake of this demo, a company that manufactures outdoor gear. And what I see here is a set of segments that represent some commonalities in my loyal customers. So I could see, for example, that I have a, one segment here, which is the, the men hiking boot purchasers. So users that have purchased some of my men hiking boots. And I just came up, you know, we might ca just came up with a new boot, and we want to market to more of those uh, men that like hiking. I don't want to sell to those that already have boots because they might have bought it just last month. So I want to more, find more that look like them, right? And the way I do that, I drop in. I've picked the lookalike functionality, and I'm straight away presented with a model. And the reason it's straight away there is because the system pre-computes those models uh, on demand on the back end as soon as, a priori, as soon as those segments appear there. What I see here is the trade-off between similarity and reach on the left, uh, the notion that I can trade off some similarity to get higher reach. So, you know, marketers sometimes have some reach constraints or, or, or um, objectives. And so a marketer would pick the highest level of reach, the highest level of similarity that gives them the reach that they aspire for. And if we pick one of those, we go ahead, we create a segment. By that we mean we take those set of users now that satisfy that, con that condition, and with one more click, I can start sending it over to all my execution partners. So I can send it over to Amazon and Walmart for targeting over there, or Facebook, or send it to other Salesforce cloud, etc. It's as simple as that. Let's look a little bit into what, uh, you know, the, the data science a little bit behind what we've just seen. Uh, on a higher level, we use a naive based framework for the model. We could have, of course, picked any one of other linear or nonlinear models out there, but naive based performed fairly well. It's a straightforward classification problem. More importantly, at the scale we operate, signal to noise becomes super important. We have hundreds of thousands of features, so we do aggressive feature selection. Uh, just to get the right data into the, the model. Uh, and we, we have some proprietary special source magic uh, machine learning for dealing with the autocorrelation in the data, uh, and that fixes some of the limitations of the naive base. Right. Now, we're not here to talk about data science uh, in detail. If you want to know more, then come and talk to us afterwards. But what we are really interested in here is how we went about implementing it and some of the issues we've met there. OK, with any given machine learning um, problems, this is a very typical uh, pipeline. So you start with a prepared job that retrieves the data, normalizes it, cleans it a little bit, and then the data gets fed in the, to the trainer. Where the trainer generates the model, and then the model gets passed to the classifier and combine it with the data you're going to use to classify uh, and generate the result. Let's do some quick of the back of the envelope calculation to assess the scale. Uh, so first of all, the trainer takes all the users. We have billions of them. Uh, in the system, we also have hundreds, thousands of segments and features. The trainer, uh, the prepared job typically have a running complexity of order n. And in this case, we generate data to the order of 10 to the 14th. Uh, the trainer then takes all this data and uses to train the model uh, for each of the segments. It has a typical running complexity of O n squared. Classify job takes all the models and run it against each of the users to generate, a, uh, to calculate the similarity and it have a similar uh, running complexity as a trainer. So clearly with the scale that we're operating on, uh, any of the off the shelf packages or software like scikit-learn is not going to work. We have to build customized algorithms and, uh, and deploy them on large distributed systems. So basically, that's what we did. And it did not turn out so great. We have lots of failures. These failures ranging from a lot of the Stack Overflow exceptions. Nodes start dying uh, one after the other, uh, eventually killing the cluster. Jobs stuck in the middle, takes hours to complete. 
end. We have memory problems. We have disk problems. We also have some network problems. So whatever you name it, we have it. All right. There's no surprising here. The cost went through the roof. <laughs> we suffer from poor job utilization, tasks running very long. Because of these failures, we need to perform retries. So we have a lot of problems. So today, we're going to share with you four main problems here and how we solve them. The first problem here is, we, we examined here, is the framework. You see, at the time, we're using MapReduce. All right. Map, like a lot of machine learning algorithms, you need to pass, you can give a lot of run to the original big data sets in order to calculate multiple parameters uh, that you need for the model. And you need a lot of intermediate results to save up. Uh, MapReduce is actually pretty great in terms of managing um, the data distributions and node, distribution, node management and some resource management as well uh, within a MapReduce cycle. Because of the nature uh, of the algorithm, we need a lot of mappers, a lot of reducers. So in this case, we have to handle ourselves uh, the I.O. between each uh, MapReduce cycles. That leads to a lot of I.O. cost. So you need to save them into the disk, and then you need to retrieve them back up again. And also, not to mention, code complexity becomes a big issue as well. So it's not apparent what we're trying to do. Uh, in order to implement basic features, we need a lot of code. Let's show you with a quick example here. So in order to calculate the basic uh, uh, numbers that you need to fit into the model uh, for the naive base, the simple naive base without any feature selection or autocorrelation uh, correction here, you need all these four numbers, which are number of features, total population, segment populations, and segment population overlap. All right. It turns out we need all these code to just calculate these very, very simple numbers. All right. Map produce is, is great in some certain circumstances, but it's just not that flexible. You require a lot of code to calculate very simple numbers. It's not designed for this type of application. So when we switch to Spark, things got much better. You see. These are the code that used to calculate all these four numbers. Plain, simple Scala code you would expect to write uh, with any collection of objects uh, without worrying about the underlying memory management or, or data serialization between tasks. It handles things in memory if it needs to, um, or store it into disk if it needs to do that as well. Okay. However, that is not the end of the story. Even with Spark, when you're operating on very large scale data, you know, and also in the cloud, as we mentioned, we're, we're big clients of uh, Amazon uh, Web Service, it's, it's not, you will have a lot of problems. So the first one is the data. So remember the prepared job, it needs to retrieve all these data. We use a lot of, uh, S3 is our main storage engine. So a lot of data is stored in S3 in a lot of different uh, directories. Mm -hmm. So we need to retrieve it, right? So what's the problem? Can't you just uh, load those RDDs and uh, concat them together one by one? Uh, it works for small number of directories, but it does not work for a uh, large number of directories. You see, uh, the way Spark, uh, the way the union RDD works and how Spark um, serialize the task is that you will, you will end up getting a stack overflow exception when you're trying to map function to this union RDD. Hmm. So I remember Spark has that special union thing exactly for that, to union large uh, numbers of RDDs together, no? Yes, correct. This does work in a sense the code does run. However, this one is actually painfully slow. Uh, the problem here is not the union operation anymore. Uh, so Spark Analyze uses HDFS API to interact with storage, compatible storage system like S3. However, 
AWS S3 is not, strictly speaking, a file system. It's a key value store. And uh, the cost to retrieve the files for each of the, um, the, for, for each of the directories is a network core. So it executed on the master node in a serial fashion. Each of these calls typically takes at least two seconds to complete. And with thousands of directories, it takes hours. While all the slave nodes stay in there in idle, doing nothing. Since the problem here is to actually uh, minimize the number of network calls, you can actually just simply use uh, AWS S3 APIs directly, uh, retrieving most of the files, and then filter the files you want and distribute the file URIs to the executors um, and let the executors themselves using the same API to retrieve and parse the content. Remember, uh, if, you are files, if your file size varies a lot between each of the um, directories, you might want to shuffle them uh, before you parallel them to the uh, executors. This will avoid the problem of a small number of executors getting all the large files. Also, um, you might want to set a reasonable parallelism factor. Uh, we found that uh, three times the total number of CPU cores or executors uh, perform the best. Let's look at another uh, one of those problems, scaling problems we met into. So remember the order n square in the trainer. Uh, one of the causes of that order n square is a, a simple self-join operation, right? Uh, Self-join is fair enough and, and straightforward to code, but it, it's a very expensive operation. So, you know, recap quickly. The data we have coming in is user with a, a set of unique features they belong to. Uh, we need to normalize that, join on the user ID, replace the user ID now with ones, aggregate together, accounting for permutations, and we have the final result, right? Now, can we do better than that, right? Uh, because the still for large clients ended up being very costly. And uh, part of the you know, answer is here in another thing that user ID eventually gets replaced with one here. So maybe user ID is not really that important. And really what's important is the unique combination of features that each user belongs to. And maybe if we aggregate on that unique feature combination, we can reduce the data. And as we all know, join, uh, you know, is order n square, even a, a sort merge join is still very expensive. So you want to push the join operation to the last step if possible, reducing as much of the data as possible going in. And that's what we've done. We've uh, identified those unique feature uh, combination, introduced a hash to aggregate over that, joined on the hash, and then got the, exactly the same result at the end with a, a massive reduction in the data going into the join. Um, this is, this is coding it up. I mean, still fairly, just a couple more lines of code. You condense first, replace with a hash, and then uh, aggregate on that, uh, self-join on that, sorry. Let's look at the last one. Yeah. So the last problem we're going to share is uh, a foreign key join. So it's fairly common in database operations uh, where basically a foreign key join is you're joining on a set of data that have unique keys and a set of data that has a foreign key, which is not unique. Typically, this is not a problem, but in some cases, uh, the one that have a foreign key have, have the keys that's very skewed, meaning a large portion of data is have small set of keys. So in this case, you see a big portion of the rows have the key user one. So when Spark performs such a join, it will typically send the, the the data with the same key uh, to the same executor in order to perform the actual join. Uh, if, in this case, executor one. In this case, uh, sometimes if the, if the data is too large with the same key, then the executor may not have enough memory to deal with it, results of failure, and the next executor picks it up, failure as well, and then you start to experience this slow and painful death of a cluster. One of the, the ways to solve it is actually introduce a salt, uh, which will break up the skewness on, on, the, on the data two side. Um, but in this case, you actually need to inflate the data with a unique keys as well, which is not ideal in some circumstances. Alternatively, you can actually distribute. If, if, the, if the one with the primary key is small enough, 
you can actually basically just copy it to all the slave nodes or executor nodes and perform a match on the data two side. Uh, Spark SQL actually already implements this. This is called broadcast hash join uh, for the Spark SQL. But for our case, uh, the, the ones with the primary key is not um, small enough. So it's, it's still pretty easy to solve. All you need to do is um, find out where the, which keys are skewed, partition the data in data one, send over the ones with skewed keys, and then perform the join, perform join on the rest of the data. Pretty simple as well. You pay Spark, have this function called broadcast, which will make the data available on all the executors, and you pay a small price in order to um, find the skewness, but it makes such joint possible before it wasn't even possible. Okay, okay let's, let's recap a little bit. So we wanted to scale a data science uh, sort of application. Uh, we first had to move from Hadoop to Spark to find the right framework for the cyclic nature of our algorithms to reduce a lot the overhead of, uh, of processing the same data again and again. Uh, we've also introduced this uh, S3 retrieval uh, algorithm that dealt with the, the issue of parallelizing right, our, our retrieval operation that before that was mainly on the master. You can see huge benefits on, on the time that uh, those tasks were uh, taking. Uh, we also introduced the, the condensed join that uh, on the data had up to 10x sometimes a uh, um, factor of, of shrinking, which you know, comes up with the order n square to almost uh, 100x factor in the, in the processing there. And we have this uh, uh, skew join uh, solution. We found the hybrid join, which made the, some of the jobs even possible to run. Um, so that's, that's some of the improvements we introduced. And what so, are the results? Yeah, so that's a, that's a result. So after moving to Spark, we actually have much, much less failure now. Uh, this is mainly due to reduced code complexity, where Spark handles a big portion of the distribution side, where we get to concentrating more on the, on the actual modeling problem. And also, we can implement uh, fairly complex operations like the hybrid joins with just a few lines of code. All we need to do is identify where the problems and the coding exercise is actually pretty simple. We also have a very big performance boost. Um, this is observed on our large clients, more ob obviously, because the I.O. cost uh, becomes a more dominant factor when they have a lot of data. And combined with both uh, reduced failure rate and running time, we typically use just, just one third of cost. And to summarize, Spark is pretty good at have, provides a wide range of higher level APIs where you can just write your normal Scala code and do the things. And it also provides fairly straightforward and simple, intuitive, lower level APIs as well. Should that become useful and you need to tweak what's underlying it, you can do that as well. Great, so this, is, this concludes the, the talk. I mean, we've, you know, we gave you just one example of some of the problems we're solving, we're working at a very large scale, solving many problems, you know, cutting edge technology and algorithm, deep learning, you name it. Um, and uh, we're very excited to be here and answer any questions you have. Awesome. So um, if you have questions, please come up to one of the two mics on either side of the auditorium, uh, and our uh, talkers will be glad to answer any questions you have for the next five minutes. OK. Uh, Hi. Uh, I'm Mohan. I work. It's work. Uh, uh, so uh, you mainly explained uh, data using RDDs, right? And RDDs have been like deprecated, not deprecated, but they've been like, mm -hmm. uh, at least Spark says that we should, uh, uh, the da Databricks community, they say that we shouldn't be using them anymore. Have you tried anything with data sets? And have you tried any, uh, or uh, have you explored using like columnar formats, which can like help speed up most of your uh, computations that you have there? Yeah, sure, I can answer yeah. that. Uh, so yeah, we, we value a lot of uh, uh, type safety here, 
And this results in a lot of things you can do while compile time check. The newer data set API, unfortunately at the Spark at least 2.1, is still labeled as experimental. We actually do try to use it. Um, there's some issues with it does not do flat maps with our own um, data format. And uh, um, it does not seem to have the, the same level, even with the, the tungsten APIs, the same level of performance, even with RDDs, with just simple Java serialization. We tried it. Uh, it's not stable. And, and the joints and everything, you can't, it's not, you, you can't, you, you, st you start using strings and as, as certain aspects to specify the column names and, uh, and other things, it breaks a lot of, of the, the type safety that we used to have. So that's why we're still sticking with an RDD implementation. We, we are excited about data sets and, and everything coming on that way. And I think that eventually we'll settle into a place that you don't have to give up all the good stuff that you, you had before with RDDs to, to you know, jump on a new bandwagon. But um, yeah, we, we have some, some experiments that showed some performance improvement using some of the new features uh, around Spark SQL, et cetera. But uh, I suspect that eventually next yeah. few versions will migrate. Yeah, there are some simple parties actually already using data set APIs before the most complex part that uh, hasn't shown good yeah. improvements. OK, I had a question about uh, the hardware that you're running on when you're doing these performance tests. Can you give us some more details about the hardware? Yeah, it's, it's the same uh, EMR cluster, basically, we're running. So we, we used to have the same setting for, for the same number of nodes, same, uh, same type of node for, from AWS EMR. And we have running on the exactly the same setup, basically. So we're the hardware is the same average. throughout. And then, like, how many nodes are you talking? Yeah, so we, I mean, it's fair to say that our, I mean, this is not just for, for data science application. We're, uh, you know, we're an AWS shop. Uh, for intended purposes, I think a lot of our, a lot of the smarts of uh, what we've developed over the years is how to squeeze the most out of the AWS uh, infrastructure. It thinks about smart bidding on spot market and getting the the right time at the right place clusters. Um, but I mean, in any given time, we'll be talking about you know uh, hundreds of clusters with hundreds of nodes each. So these are these are big clusters. Thank you. Question on um, lookalike modeling. So, do you use uh, min hashing of user actions or do you use Wotwek to uh, model user actions to find similarity between other users? How do you do lookalike modeling of users? Sorry, I, I didn't hear correct the question. How do you do lookalike modeling of users? How do you segment the users and how do you find these users who are similar to other users? Yeah, so, I mean, we just touched on it before and I, we should probably sit down and talk after that in okay. a bit more details. But the, the high level framework is, I mean, the, the, the scoring framework is naive based, but that's just a small part of the, of the question, right? But uh, essentially we assess, we have, against any given user, we have hundreds of thousands of features. Uh, so the first thing we do is get to figure out which one of those features really matter. So we do the classic selection, uh, feature selection. We use linear discriminant analysis there, which is one of the techniques. Um, and then we, we, we build an aggregate model on each one of those uh, target uh, um, populations of characterizing them based on those feature set. Then we project it over to the rest of the, the users. Awesome. So that's all the time we have for questions for now. If you have more questions, please come see Kashin and Jakob after, the, after this. Uh, and they'll be around the conference, too. So uh, thank you again. Thank you.